Dear Philomena by Mugabe Bienkia. Page 5. Prologue. Once upon a time, there was a jubilant Ugandan mother of three living in Lagos, Nigeria. Her name was Leocardia. Leocardia lived with her empathetic husband, Ladislaus, and their three vivacious children, her oldest daughter, Tina, and her two sons, Kizito and Victor. Years before, when Leocardia was only 10 years old, she wanted one, a career helping others, two, to be in a position to provide for her family. Three, a fabulous, extravagant wedding at Rubaga Church. Four, an empathetic, sensitive, smart, and handsome husband. And five, last but definitely not least, four children. A girl as her first, two boys as her second and third, and a girl as her fourth and final child. Years later, after struggling through a difficult childhood, all of her dreams were actually slowly coming true. Locardia had a fulfilling career as a teacher, a headmaster, and later on as a nurse. She was able to work hard and support her family. She got married in a beautiful ceremony at Rubaga Church to her wonderful, intelligent, dashing, and intuitive husband. Last but definitely not least, she had given birth to one girl and two boys in that order. All she needed was one more baby girl and she would have achieved something very few ever do, the actualization of her childhood dreams. Three years after the birth of her youngest son, Victor, Locardia realized that she was expecting her fourth child. She was over the moon. She prayed every morning and every night that she would be granted a baby girl to round out her quartet and fulfill her childhood dreams. Five months passed. Locardia went in for her scheduled obstetric ultrasound. She was finally going to find out the sex of the baby. She walked in with feverish anticipation, beads of perspiration forming on every crevice of her body. The doctor greeted her. She lay down on the table. Locardia winced at the cold touch of the ultrasound machine and waited. The doctor glanced up. Locardia glanced down. The doctor spoke. It's a girl. Four months passed. On an ordinary day, as she was cooking lunch for her family, Locardia's water broke. She was rushed to the hospital in a blur of pain screams, agony, and anticipation. Locardia's mind was hazy and groggy from the prolonged pain and sensory overload, so she balled her hands up into fists and clutched onto the one thing that she could, her baby girl's name, Philomena. Page 7, December 2014. December 13th, 2014. They're calling me the Kunta Kinte of rap, claiming a brother from the continent never spitted as confident as that. I rapped along to three card as my head bopped to the beat and my fingers clacked on the keys. Despite the upset stomach and foggy brain, my final essay on environmental planning was coming along surprisingly well. Jiggling my head back and forth to clear the wooziness, I, five seconds later, my head reflexively snapped back as I came to, suddenly realizing I had blacked out for a few seconds. Something was wrong. Something was seriously wrong. The walls caved inwards and started shifting around me. I batted my eyes, struggling to keep the weight on my eyelids at bay. Jiggling my head back and forth to clear the wooziness, I stood up. The walls continued to spin as I focused on inhaling and exhaling. Inhale. Exhale. Inhale. 
Exhale. I need to lie down. Cramming my laptop and books into my backpack, I stumbled out of the basement, crashing into several walls and corridors along the way. As I climbed the staircase, I took two steps forward for every one step back. My brain and body were out of sync, but I had one mission to fulfill. Get back to my room. Five minutes later, I propped my body up by jamming my right hand on my bedroom doorframe. It took me five minutes to carefully maneuver my rickety left hand and open the door. The door swung open. I tossed my bag onto the ground, tossed my body onto my bed. Everything faded to black. Page 11, February 2001. Page 12, February 16th, 2001. Mugabe! Mugabe! Mommy's screams peeled my cat-like focus away from the batsman and towards her, waving at me in the foreground. It's time to go home. Hurry, your siblings are already in the car. All right, Mommy, I yelled back as I reluctantly said goodbye to my friends and jogged towards her direction. Wham! 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 Disoriented, groggy, I was utterly blindsided by what felt like two sledgehammers violently smashing into my temples in sync with my heartbeat. I shook my head and continued jogging in my mommy's direction. The sledgehammers pounded harder and harder into my temples. Again, and again, and again. Fighting back tears, I grit my teeth and soldiered through. I was one tough cookie after all. My mommy had said something about the dangers of over-medicating. My mommy had said taking a nap could cure a headache better than a painkiller. Complaining was a sign of weakness after all. As I got to my mommy, she wrapped me up in an unwanted hug. I struggled to get free. She kissed me. I harumphed. Ain't nobody got time for that. Climbing into the car, my brother Victor kicked at my legs as I slid past. <sighs> the bane of my existence. When, oh when, would my prayers be answered? When, oh when, would the torment stop? When, oh when, could Victor and I actually become friends? I sat down, and it took every ounce of strength to contain myself. Noella cried. Tina, Kizito, Nadine, and Victor talked incessantly and unnecessarily loud, and my mommy and daddy had their own conversation up front. At the same time, the continual smashing of the sledgehammers drove themselves deeper and deeper into my temples. Wham! 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 Why are you being so quiet? What's wrong with you? Kazito asked. He was coming from a nice place, but his question forced me to respond. Responding to Kazito took energy away from me, energy that was better suited to my internal battle. Why do you have such a big nose? I lobbed a flippant retort back at Kazito, hoping to shut him up by lashing out. Unfortunately, this dragged me into a war of words with Kazito and Nadine that lasted until we got home. Regrets. When we finally got back home, I lobbed one final insult at Kazito to get the final word in and ran upstairs to my bedroom to crash. It was finally nap time. Fifteen minutes later, just as I was drifting off into a blissful slumber, Victor poked his head through the bedroom door. We need a fourth player for Karam. You win? The sledgehammers had dulled a little. And let's be honest, I didn't want to miss out on the game. So a few bruised fingers and egos later, I was actually beating Victor. I had finally wiped the smug grin off of his face. Wham! 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 The sledgehammers were still going at it, 
but I was doing my best to tune them out and focus on the matter at hand. Just beat Victor. The game got sidetracked as Kazito and Nadim started an aimless conversation. Victor was avidly trying to insert himself into the conversation, which led to everyone but me forgetting whose turn it was next. Everyone started arguing over whose turn it was, so I spoke up. It's Nadine's turn, I cheekily said, making sure to layer on my air of superiority. They continued arguing. It's Nadine's turn, I said louder, getting annoyed at being unheard. They still continued arguing. It's Nadine's turn, I yelled. They just continued arguing. It's Nadine's turn. It's Nadine's turn. It's Nadine's turn. They all turned and stared at me. Why were they looking at me like that? I was just trying to tell you whose turn it was since you all forgot that it's Nadine's turn. No sound came out of my mouth. I looked down at my agape jaw and suddenly realized I hadn't said a word. Nothing. I had been thinking I was speaking. I had no voice. <coughs> All that came out of my mouth was an awkward croaking sound as I broke out into violent convulsions and tears. It's Nadine's turn.